No, we didn't have a cell phone. I can't even start my uh, TV on my computer. And when I got to the call, stop, stop. <laughs> and it won't. It'll be all voice control. <laughs> no. You'll have to get yourself a voice interchange for it. Well, see, I probably didn't know how to work that either. My grandchildren were just absolutely. Oh, hey, Paul, oh, this is just wonderful. I just let oh, you yeah, say that. I said, no, you're mm -hmm. not going to drive it. <laughs> no, you're not going to drive it. It's all for just a little while. Absolutely not. You're not going to drive it. Well, Mr. Plant, you could probably get about twice for that Prius that he paid for. Because, you know, they've they got that, you know. So, well, I have people call me and write me. Every time I go to the dealership, one of my Hello, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening to you. Good evening. This is Ronald. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> you are here. And and what yeah. party do you represent? <laughs> Birthday parties. <laughs> okay. Angie's here? Yes. All right. You were the one who was going to sign up for being here present. Okay. Yeah. Is there... <laughs> Uh, there's an extra bonus for that you get. You're going to pass me right off the bat? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's real good about passing it, but you're never going to get money. <laughs> and now we've got the four online. Uh, Eddie, you want to introduce yourself? Actually, still on mute. Oh. Okay. There she is. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. My name is Ade. This is my first time in the program. I'm happy to be here. Okay. And we've met Ronald and Hello. Ms. Walker. Yes. Hi, my name is Kenva Barr. I've been. Um, I think this is like my maybe fourth or fifth semester with SHBI. Um, okay. Yes, I've been taking classes. Um, I've never really, um, I, well, I've been sticking to doing it online because of the pandemic. It's been a lot more, well, it's been better. <laughs> yep. And Ms. Brown, Bro Bro Brown. This is my second semester doing classes. Towards the end of the semester, at towards the end of the course, I I go in person. Okay. But for now, I've been under the weather with a cold, so I've been doing online. All right. Did you all have any trouble getting on? Nope. It's pretty easy. Okay, good. Then we can keep our distance. <laughs> uh, as you uh, know, when you sign this up, uh, this is a class on how we got the Bible. And uh, the answer to that is very simple and very short, so we can finish tonight and be through. Um, and the answer is nobody knows. Uh, there, there are a few uh, ancient uh, uh, traditions, myths, uh, some educated guesses. Um, but the reality is we don't hardly know anything about how we actually got it. Uh, we're going to take two nights to look at a little bit in terms of 
how it was created in terms of the writing of the Old Testament, the writing of the New Testament. Uh, the main scope of this book, especially with the textbook um, that uh, Lightfoot uh, has provided, is how it got from where it was when it came into existence to us. And we're talking about nearly 3,000 years of history. So in uh, 12, 14 classes, we're going to be doing a mile high flyover. Um, we'll look, uh, as I said, very briefly at the production, what we little we know, what clues we have in the Bible about how these books came into existence. We'll look very briefly at how they ended up in the collections that we have for Christians, the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, for the Jews, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and uh, that, like their production, is as much a mystery. And then we'll look at its preservation um, through the centuries from when it was actually in existence uh, till now. Um, and that will involve a brief look into um, the reality of the copies that we have and all the kinds of problems that involves. And then since we're English speakers, uh, we'll take a little time to talk about the translation of the Bible into our language so we have it in our hands. And that's pretty much uh, the uh, nature of the course. I'll uh, send you all a uh, copy of, uh, let's see if I can actually put this up so you can see it now. Um, here it is. Um, the uh, basic topics and uh, as I said, all of those are gonna be very brief in terms of what they cover. Uh, as you can see here, the textbook barely touches on some of these topics and uh, on these and on even some of those that uh, the textbook does. I'll have handouts that I'll be sending you like this one. Um, and uh, encourage you to look at other places for that kind of information. Um, for the uh, writing of the Old Testament, especially, and for its counterpart, uh, the writing of the New Testament, we'll actually be looking at those two documents and what they uh, show us about some of that process. Um, and uh, I want to encourage you to uh, uh, find ways to uh, acquaint yourself with that material, which is strictly in the Bible. And in order to do that, um, it's uh, helpful if you have a couple of tools that facilitate your being able to see that. Uh, the, the frequency with which writing occurs in the Old Testament, uh, where books occur in the Old Testament. And, and of course, uh, we'll look at in a moment, there aren't books in the Old Testament, they haven't been invented yet. Um, and uh, in addition to being able to do that for these two class sessions, uh, it's just a good thing for you to have. So I'll be sending you a list of uh, Bible study programs that you can put on your computer that have all kinds of uh, marvelous capabilities. Um, 
so that in a flash, you can look and see the 147 times uh, this word, this idea appears in the Bible and exactly where. Uh, if you don't have such a tool, um, I encourage you very strongly uh, to look at one or more of the ones that I'll uh, be highlighting for you. Uh, there are several that are free for the basic program uh, and a number of the basic books that you would need in that program, they're free. Um, and then sky's the limit on a couple of the programs as to how much you can spend because these programs now have been developed for um, high level scholarship. So the libraries available in these programs are, are just uh, uh, almost unlimited. Um, and especially if you're just getting started in your life of uh, real Bible study, uh, and certainly if you're entering into any kind of ministry post, uh, having one of these is uh, uh, just uh, irreplaceable. Um, the uh, earlier you get started with it, the better you learn it, the more you add to your library, uh, the more usable it becomes. But it's, that will cost money down the line. Uh, but uh, there's much, much that you can do in the free versions and a great deal you can even do on a couple of programs that are just online. Uh, that, of course, limits you to being able to use it only when you're online. Um, it, you know, if you're using the desktop and you always have to be plugged in anyway, then you can use that without any trouble. If you're used to using a laptop, most all of these now have app versions that you can put on a smartphone and do a great deal of this even on a smartphone. Uh, and I'll send you that list. Um, I'm, I'm meant to have it available tonight and um, my computer went on the fritz twice today. Uh, uh, if we have some time at the end of the class, um, and I can bring up a couple of those. I'll uh, give you a brief description, but I'll give you a list, has the links that you can look at them um, and uh, uh, see what's involved. If any of you are already using uh, Bible Gateway on your computer or your smartphone, it has some of these capabilities built into it, and you can even use it for that. Um, it'll work fine. For uh, the class, the textbook uh, is almost essential. Uh, we have five copies they ordered that are available here. I could ship it to you if you wanted to send me the money uh, or send it to Cheryl at SHBI and I'll ship you the book, slip it in and uh, Pat an envelope and send it to you. Uh, they're obviously available where we got these uh, at Amazon or Christian Books. And I looked on Amazon and there's a whole bunch of them for about a third the price. Uh, and uh, when they say, I, I've ordered a number of used books that they just say are uh, 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 acceptable, and I never had one of those I, that I was disappointed in, that I couldn't use because it just been marred up so badly. Um, so those are available um, for you to look at. Um, for um, next week, um, we're... Uh, we're gonna look at one of the things at the end of the book. Um, we're gonna look at the, the fundamental faith issue behind the book, and that is, that is its inspiration and therefore its authority, uh, which has uh, obviously uh, been a major point of contention in the Christian world. 
um, not so much in the Jewish world, but some. Um, and you need to know what the ground looks like uh, on that issue because you will inevitably run into it as you're reading. Every one of these topics that we'll be looking at has a whole library behind it. There will be numerous articles on the web that you can find on any one of these topics. And uh, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, take advantage of them. Just remember you're on the web and you have no idea uh, what the bias, uh, what the prejudices of the person who wrote this material on the web is. And therefore, you always have to read uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, critical thinking. But of course, that's how we ought to read all the time. Uh, and uh, even the Bible ought to be read that way. Uh, so we'll be looking at that next week just to get that out of the way because obviously it becomes a part of the struggle uh, all the way through and especially in the modern uh, theological uh, ground framework. Uh, it's a divisive issue um, which then spills over into what kind of, which Bible you're going to read and which Bible you're going to use and all that kind of stuff. And that's why we want to take a cursory look at it. There again, there's a whole library on this. Um, for those of you that want to pursue any of this material, I will also uh, be sending you a uh, list of libraries. Uh, if you aren't acquainted with the libraries in your area that have this kind of material, uh, you need to uh, take an afternoon and look at one or two of them. Uh, there's a uh, measurable amount of material out there. Um, most of these libraries are fairly open. They may require you to, uh, if you want to check out books, they may require you to uh, have some kind of membership that charges you uh, some amount of money for the year. Uh, but I'm not aware of any of them that wouldn't let you go in and visit. Uh, you probably have to identify yourself with an ID and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I'm not aware of any of them that would not allow you to go in and look and uh, see what's there. Uh, for this class, I encourage everybody to keep a notebook. Uh, if you're really, really good with a computer, then you can create your own filing system on your computer. And you can scan everything in that's already printed um, and have your own file system in your computer and always have it at hand. Um, if you don't, if you don't, haven't gotten into the habit of doing that, then I know of absolutely no alternative for having a notebook because then everything in this class that you touch, that you read, uh, the handouts that I give you, uh, notes that you take, uh, other material that you find, you have one place to put it, and then you have one place to find it when you want to look it up again. And one place then to put all the new material that you discover over the years on this same topic, that you have any interest in having available to yourself, you have a place you can put it. And then there's one place where all the little tidbits that you ever stumbled across on how we got the Bible or Bible translation or Bible manuscripts or uh, the, the canon of the Bible or any of this material, you can put your hands on it when you wanna find it. And it's all there in one place. Uh, so I encourage you to come up with some kind of a procedure um, uh, to do that. Um, 
If you want to push for a super grade in the class, there'll be some papers for you to uh, do a little bit of writing on occasionally. Uh, you'll discover most of these, I'm not looking so much for specific information as I am your reflection. Because the specific information you could find anytime you wanted, uh, especially if you've kept your notebook up. Uh, so whether you remember it or not is not nearly as important as do you understand it and is it meaningful to you and can you have any usable sense of it? Uh, okay, any uh, preliminary questions anybody has? Has anybody else been able to join us? Yes, here's another person. I think, and she's not even, or is it he, Pradia, is it? And Melissa is now on. I just want to praise the Lord, Pastor. Pradia is not on the list they gave me, but I knew you were going to meet you. Yes, sir. Okay, anybody else and I'm missing. If you come in at any time, be sure at the end of the class to alert me or send me an email, it might be a better place, better way. Um, did all of you get my email about how to get on or get the email that I sent? Um, yes. I probably need to make sure I'm, I've got the right email for everyone. Okay. How much time have I taken away from myself now? Twenty one minutes. Okay. Um, let me put this back down again. Brother Platt? Yes. A quick question. Um, somebody had um, put in the chat a question. Are there going to be any tests? Tests. Do, does there need to be a test? <laughs> Just asking. Uh, I don't know if there needs to be one. No. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit about testing this material like a professor that I had in graduate school who said, when you get through with my class, you're still not gonna know enough. <laughs> uh, they, as I said, I'm, the, a lot of the details are, uh, you know, I could, I could give you a vocabulary list at the end of each session with five or six or seven uh, word special to that particular no, topic. No, thank <laughs> you. Explain these uh, by not and not look at your notes to do that. Well, of course, there's no way I would know that you looked at your notes. Uh, so uh, that's for sure uh, you wouldn't. <laughs> and and so as I said, just the information, uh, whether you remember this date or this term or whatever, those are the kind of things when you were interested in them, you could look them up. Most of the written material I'll be giving you is a, a matter of your reflection, your understanding. Uh, so there won't be a, what we would call a real test. Uh, the, the test will come in how you handle this material on a weekly basis. Um, how, how challenging some of it will get, how troublesome some of it will be. Um, and uh, so there's gonna be some testing, but it won't be the academic style testing uh, that you have to worry about. Uh, until of course the pop quiz at the end, but. Uh, uh, Thank you, Brother Flat. Okay, all right. Um, 
we're going to take a little bit of time the rest of the this evening um, to make a flyover on uh, the uh, basis of how we got the Bible, which of course is dependent upon, uh, whoops, that didn't work right. I've got it, but you don't have it. Hang on a minute. Okay, the fact that the Bible is written. It's all written material. Um, and writing is an old, old system. You see some dates down here under history, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, Egypt. Uh, you go back three millennia before Jesus. And there are symbols that are being used to communicate. Um, the writing culture of the Old Testament, of, of the Old Testament times, uh, is still one of those issues that we're grappling with, to understand why they wrote, what they did with those writings, and it appears that in the ancient world, most of the writing was done simply as uh, a, a, an aid to remembering. Um, by the time you get to uh, the, the emergence of Palestine, you, you, you clearly have communicating writing. A person is writing another person who now is going to look at this material, this information, for the first time. But much before that, it appears that the culture was virtually completely verbal. And writing was used as a mnemonic device to help you remember what you were supposed to already know. And this persists even into Old Testament times, even into Jewish history to this day. Um, when um, Bible, old Hebrew Bible uh, texts are printed, not just scrolls, are printed with nothing but the consonants. You don't have any idea what the vowels are. In some of the old systems, there were not even any breaks in the consonants. So you simply had a string of consonants. Well, where does the word begin and where does it end? Well, if you're cold turkey with this text, you might have a problem. But the text wasn't there for a cold turkey person. The, co the text was there for the person who knew the text. And all they needed was a little memory catch up now and then. Uh, this is the offstage prompter in a drama. When the actor forgets their line, there's somebody to give him the first two words so he can get back on track. Uh, and, and that's why they could write that way. Uh, the writing was there for you already knowing the story, already knowing the information. And this was simply a way of helping you remember correctly, uh, helping you not skip a place, uh, helping you repeat when you're supposed to repeat, even though it's repeating. Um, because that's the way the story, that's the way the document was produced. Uh, 
But by the time Israel begins to emerge, uh, clearly by then, there were documents commonly being written to be transmitted. And we have copies of that kind of stuff. Uh, where an individual distant from the writer is being informed about certain activities, events, uh, materials, or something. Uh, and so you're reading it for the first time. Unfortunately, in the production of the first reading systems, you had a very, very complex writing system. Um, initially, of course, they were a little more than pictograms. Uh, then the pictograms became more stylistic. And then gradually they could make it totally stylistic, which meant then you had to know what the style, what the symbol was. So you're into the kind of thing you have with Japanese and Chinese, where you have a symbol the symbol may stand for the whole word. The symbol may stand for a part of the word. And so then you get the complexity of was the language, was the written language developed in order to represent sounds or was it more graphic? And so there's still a whole lot that we don't know about this. Whole lot we're still learning about how the systems work. The scholars have gotten to where they can read a lot of this Sumerian stuff and Hittite stuff and Euclidean stuff and Egyptian stuff. But we're always finding things that we didn't catch on to yet. In the early 2000s to 1500s, in the southeastern part of the Mediterranean area, uh, South Syria, Palestine, there began to emerge what we know as an alphabet, where you take a symbol and you have it represent just a sound. And then you can string these sound symbols together and form an infinite number of words. And now you have a very reduced number of symbols that you have to learn. Now there's not 5,000 characters because you have 5,000 words in your vocabulary. Now you can have all 5,000 words with 20, 25, 30 symbols. Uh, when this first emerges, the, the symbols are only for the consonantal sounds, the sounds that begin or end the sounding system. And especially the vocal sound that is associated with that and slides from one consonant to the other, what we know as vowels, were not represented. And so even then, it was a little unwieldy because again, you almost had to know the words. Now, you've probably seen this on the internet sometime where somebody has taken a, a short letter um, and, and dropped a bunch of letters and you discover you can still read it. You can still see what it was. And of course, you see, that's even more true if you already knew what it was. If you knew this is the story of creation in Genesis 1, you already know the story. Well, then again, you just kind of need some consonantal clues to make sure you stay in the right order and that kind of thing. Um, so the writing by alphabet actually emerges in that part of the country to which Abraham and his descendants come. Um, Hebrew is one of the earliest alphabetic languages. The alphabet that it adopts is uh, soon adjusted, even by the time we have it in the Bible. There are certain letters in the alphabet that don't really have a sound anymore. They don't use that. 
they don't make the sound that that letter originally represented in whatever language it originated. And so that the letter's still there in their writing system, but it doesn't hardly do anything anymore. Now, when the Greeks adopted this alphabet system, they discovered the same thing. And so they took some of those letters that they didn't have sounds anymore, and they made them their vowel sounds. So they stood for their vowel sounds. Uh, unfortunately, like in English, A, E, I, O, U aren't the only vowel sounds. Every one of those has two, three, four sounds each to it. Uh, but uh, with a certain codings that we learn instinctively, uh, the, whether this is a long vowel or a short vowel and some of that kind of stuff, uh, you can still get it to the place that uh, you don't, a person what, doesn't have any idea what this material is about, but they can read it pretty flawlessly. Uh, the Hebrews eventually do the same thing. They take some of these letters that their language doesn't really have a sound for anymore, and they start turning them into vowel sounds. And we see that in the Bible text. And the scholars even can point to the age of a text based on whether there's a preponderance of these letters that clearly have to be there as vowel sounds because there's no explanation for them to be in the word as a consonant. Uh, and so you have writing with an alphabet can become much more democratic. You don't have to spend long years uh, in, to learn the written codes. And so writing can become fairly common. Not that everybody knew how to read and write, but many people would know, especially people of any stature in the community, not just the priest or the prophet when they begin to emerge. Um, maybe the king himself couldn't read, but he had people who could. Uh, and nobody should be surprised that those people who can read and write are called by the writing terms because that's what they do. Uh, and so the scribe is a scriber. Uh, the fact that he can scribe, he can write, obviously means he can also read. Now, eventually that will become not always true because from the early middle ages through to at least the Renaissance and probably beyond, there were many copies of the Bible made by people who couldn't read it. They were just copying the symbols. They, they learned the shape of all the symbols and knew how to write all the symbols, but they didn't know what it meant. Uh, so they were scribes of the writing kind, but they weren't scribes of the reading side. Um, but that's a late development. Uh, obviously, because these scribes could read and write, they're going to be important officials in the economy and the politics of the country. Because as business grows, as international relations grow, there's obviously the need for frequent communication. And so they become an important and privileged class. They may be slaves. They may be owned, not paid by the boss, uh, but they're still privileged because they're a scribe. They're a reader and a writer. Um, the materials they use, depending on where they live, um, aid us and complicate us. Um, 
Obviously, the first things that were around were the rocks that they built. And you had to figure out how to chisel them out and inscribe them, scrape them, and, and that kind of thing. In the east, in Mes Mesopotamian Valley, uh, they quickly figured out that they could do this with clay. And so you'd make yourself a ball of clay and you'd flatten it out a little bit. And then with an instrument, you could poke into it at a slight angle um, and you could create impressions. And so they created impressions that have a great semblance to Chinese and Japanese writing again. Uh, so that you could have a system that would be simple to do because it's soft clay and you can pretty fast make a bunch of indentions in the clay. And when you fill up that piece of clay, you grab another piece and you continue the story. Uh, that makes it cumbersome. The story is very long. Uh, you're gonna have to have a big bookcase uh, because you're not going to be able to have chapters. You're going to just be have paragraphs, maybe, of this thing. Uh, can anybody remember a place in the Old Testament where stone's written on? Yeah, the Ten Commandments uh, are written on stone. Uh, the uh, Hebrews early adopted the hides. Um, Tanned leather, and they used the pen and ink, hides, leather. And later, by times of shortly before times of Jesus, they figure out how to do that with very thin layer. And so you get what's frequently called vellum. Uh, and uh, it becomes the precursor of the very finest, the parchments, which are almost in some cases translucent. Uh, sometimes there are copies of those that's kind of hard to read because you're seeing on the backside as well as on the front side. Uh, and they use pens and inks. The Hebrews appear to have fairly early as written material uh, for religious purposes, what is the background of the Old Testament, very early adapt this letter system and uh, do it with uh, conforming sizes of leather, which they glue together to make a scroll. Uh, and obviously, depending on how thick the leather is and how, how much, how tiny you're being able to write is going to dictate how long of a story, how much material you can put on a scroll before it becomes too cumbersome for you to use. And on the scrolls, they would write in columns, uh, six, eight inches at the very most wide, often shorter than that. And so you could read a column and then go to the next column and roll up the one you read and unroll the next one you're gonna read. So you had a pretty compact system. And you can make it of any, numerous, any number of sizes. And that of course would control the amount of material you could put on it. But it, it means that there was very early in Hebrew history, a system for them to write down information, to keep information, to pass information on. So we're not surprised to hear that Moses wrote and that God instructed him to write this down so the king could read it. Well, they didn't even have a king yet. They weren't gonna have a king for several hundred years but they're already writing down things. Now that of course doesn't directly um, uh, control how much he was writing down and which material 
of that that's attributed to him, he was writing down. And that's part of the issue that we're going to wrestle with as we go through this uh, inspiration issue and the writing of the Old Testament. Uh, but it, at least there's clearly the mechanism, the tradition to do this <coughs> very early. Um, the Egyptians figured out very early how to make a paper. Take the papyrus plant, smash it down into its fibers, lay down the layer of those fibers one direction and lay down another layer the opposite direction, perpendicular to it, a uh, couple of layers of that, let it dry, and you have a piece of paper. In fact, that's why it's called paper. <laughs> Pardon? It's a, um, a plant, um, long stock, uh, that has uh, fairly semi-rigid fibers running into it, uh, even more than uh, um, celery. They're tall. They're tall. Like They're like a reed. Uh, and uh, the uh, they're they're similar to uh, what's the plant for linen? Flax, uh, where they they can take the the fiber out as a thread, uh, and uh, so once the papyrus the paper was produced, then you had a pretty cheap system that you could produce documents that you could write on in pen and ink and a bundle of stack of them together. Uh, you might stick a few of them together as a roll, as a scroll, that it doesn't seem like that was done very much. Uh, if it was only two or three pieces, you could roll them up, tie them with a ribbon, and then, of course, they adopted the security system of putting a wax on the edge in one or two places, and then they could put their personal seal in it. And that way, when you send it to somebody, you could see whether it had been tampered with or not. Uh, but the paper becomes very, very widespread. And of course, then quickly it spreads outside of Egypt. Uh, to the whole Middle Eastern area, especially the, the, the Mediterranean area. Uh, cloth was used some, not uh, near as much, because it was much more expensive. And there were other uses for the flax and, and other cloth materials. Uh, they occasionally would inscribe on metals, and sometimes pretty elaborately. Um, you're, we're skipping 1,500 years, but one of the one of the finds in the Qumran material is a scroll of copper. They beat it down thin enough that they inscribed on it, and then they rolled it up. Uh, so it was not uncommon to, especially uh, small things, you could write on mementos. You could give and put inscriptions on, all that kind of stuff. So obviously a lot of this material can, provide, can survive. Uh, the hides are going to wear out. Damp climate is going to ruin them, but a dry climate is not going to materially affect them for a long time. Uh, the uh, paper, even it can survive in very dry climate, like much of Egypt is, much of the Sinai Peninsula is, much of Palestine uh, uh, is fairly dry, the Dead Sea area, for instance. And so even the paper, uh, if it's not exposed, will survive. Uh, give a 
2,000 years and it's going to begin to break down and deteriorate in various ways. But there's a there's immeasurable amount of this material that we're finding. We're finding old libraries now. Um, clear back to the very early days of writing. And every new discovery gives us another insight in that how they do it, another language that we know more about, and its grammar and its vocabulary. Uh, and that may shed some light on things in Hebrew that we couldn't understand before because it was so closely related uh, in, in their use. Uh, all of these ancient peoples had languages and unlike most of that area today, where there is an overarching language at least, um, these languages, while frequently related, were somewhat distinctive. And because, especially in Palestine, the smaller ethnic groups we have very little material from, there is little that we know about their language and therefore little that we can do to compare it with old Hebrew and therefore things about the old Hebrew that we don't know. Um, <clears throat> if you want to, uh, if you have your Bible, you bring it up on your phone. Uh, the Book of Ruth. Like uh, several stories in the Old Testament all begin with and. <laughs> it's a Hebrew alphabet, a letter in the Hebrew alphabet that has long been understood to, and it's been, and it's clearly demonstrated. It, it, you know, there's just no question that this is our and. Uh, the word, first word in the story has this letter at the beginning of it. And so the translators who followed it literally say, and in the days of the judges. Well, now there are scholars who are beginning to say there's some evidence that this isn't the and letter. This is a conjugation of an old verb form. Now, I still haven't sound, found that in any textbooks, but I haven't had the time in the last 20 years to look at any modern textbooks to see if that's there. But there are scholars who, even in the mid uh, turn of the centuries, are insisting that here is a dominant feature of Hebrew that the volumes of information have been written over as to how to understand this and how to interpret this and, and what it may mean and why it gets used here and not used there. And we're saying all that's been misunderstood. This is something entirely new. Uh, when a kinword language, the language to the north in Phoenicia was discovered uh, 50 years ago, uh, there were scholars who immediately recognized a lot of the language because it had many features common to Hebrew. They were using an alphabet that was somewhat similar. Uh, a lot of the grammar looked the same. The words, of course, were, there were strange words and there were words used in strange ways. And so they had to wrestle with this. But the more they worked with it, the more familiar they came with it. There were several scholars who would begin to jump on the fact that, hey, this is really close to Hebrew. There are some places in Hebrew that we, we never could figure out what was going on. Maybe this is a thing in Hebrew like this in this Phoenician language. And so they began to explain features in the Hebrew language based on what it looked like it was doing here and saying, well, maybe it's doing the same thing here. And that'll solve some problems. Uh, so there's still a whole lot we don't know about the language of Hebrew 
in which most of the Old Testament was written, or the language of Aramaic that supersedes it, and certain sections in Ezra and Nehemiah uh, are written in it. Uh, it's a very kindred language, and it's adopted by the Assyrian Empire and then fully adopted by the Persian Empire as the international language. And so it's the language that persists throughout the late Old Testament time. Uh, it's becoming, it's coming into effect in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, which is about 500 years before Jesus. And the Persian Empire persists clear to, to uh, Alexander the Great. And when he conquers it, he doesn't begin to impose Greek on it so that Aramaic stays still a major language in that part of the world. It's the, Ara it's the language of Palestine in Jesus' day. It stays the language and in our scholarly world, it shifts into what frequently is called Syriac because they adopt a new um, writing system. They, they go to a much more cursive uh, writing system, but it's the same language. And all the Christians of the Middle East clear to this day use that language. Well, they don't call it Aramaic. They don't call it Aramaic. It's called Syria. Syria. Uh, and uh, but that's what Jesus spoke. Yeah, that's what was being spoken in Palestine in Jesus' day, and was being spoken even more so by all the Jews who lived in the east in Babylon, Assyria, Mesopotamian area of which there actually were more Jews over there in Jesus' day than there were in Palestine. But did they speak Hebrew as well? Or? A lot of them didn't. The common people probably didn't. In fact, there were so many people who didn't that by Jesus' day, the tradition was beginning to grow in many places where on the Sabbath day when scripture was read, it was still read in Hebrew. And then it was translated into Aramaic. And so the reading of scripture was bilingual in many synagogues, especially uh, in the uh, Mesopotamian area in Jesus' day. And the tradition becomes so fixed there that it is preserved in some Orthodox Jewish synagogues to this day. Nobody speaks Aramaic, <laughs> but it's still read in Hebrew and translated into Aramaic, and then it's translated into whatever the vernacular of the country the people live in. But they still translate it in Hebrew because that's the way you do it. Uh, Even in some Orthodox churches over there, they don't use Aramaic. No, they they speak uh, in 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 the in the synagogues. The vernacular is, it is fairly common, although in the, in, in the real Orthodox and certainly in the extreme Orthodox, everything in the synagogue still takes place in Hebrew and Aramaic because that was the tradition. Uh, they don't need... The Orthodox Jewish churches are. Yeah, that was something that just <laughs> the, the Orthodox Christians, yeah, they, 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 they speak, they still speak Aramaic, right. Syria, That's Syria. Right. Yeah. And of course, through the years, it, like every language, has changed. So that yeah. for a Syrian Christian to say, I can understand the Old Testament better than you can, 
may not necessarily be true because his Syrian has changed as much as English has changed since Shakespeare's day and probably more. Uh, and, and therefore, there'll be a lot of words in ordinary Assyrian or ordinary Aramaic or Syrian that don't properly represent the authentic Hebrew meaning. Their word has shifted. Uh, and this is the problem then that we run into all the way through as we're dealing with these Bible coming to us. Because the Bible is going to come to us in all three of these languages plus. Uh, the Syrian Christians by the third century have their Bible in their language. It's a translation, quote, of Hebrew into Assyria, into Aramaic, into the Syrian language. And there are, in many instances, some fairly significant differences. And so it's not just a matter of moving this from Hebrew to Aramaic. By the third century before Jesus, there were enough Jews speaking Greek that they began to translate the Old Testament into Greek. And we have copies of that. And then, of course, as the church very quickly moves into the Roman world, the Christians very quickly translate the Bible into Latin. They do the same thing in Egypt. They do the same thing in Ethiopia. They do the same thing in Armenia. And in Armenia, the missionary who takes it to them he has to invent an alphabet so they can write it. But very quickly, the Bible comes to us in the terms of Greek, for instance, before the time of Jesus. We have copies of Greek Bibles scraps to compare to our Hebrew Bible. And we can argue, people do, that this Greek copy represents the original Hebrew copy and the current Hebrew copy is a corrupted copy. Uh, and there have been a few cases where it really looks like that may have happened that in the copying of the Hebrew text, they slipped up, they didn't catch it, and their mistakes got copied, and the real version got preserved over here in the Greek that translated. We'll talk about the problems that that involved when we get to that. But writing was there. And when you look at the issue of writing, and books and recognize that's simply the English translation for the documents that we have in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. They still hadn't, didn't have books when the New Testament was written. Uh, there are people who argue that the book is a Christian invention, uh, that the Christians wanted to be able to put their written materials together and not have them subject to being lost, like just tying all these loose pieces of paper up with a string. And so they figured out how to put them together where they were more permanently held together. Uh, nobody knows where the book, who first invented this, because first book was simply a matter of taking a bunch of pieces of paper and folding them in the middle and then tying them together permanently and then starting at the first page and going through, rather than having a bunch of sheet of paper that then you tried to fold up. And then of course, the order would be totally mixed up. Uh, what they did was fold it together and tie it first. Well, once you did that, of course, there's only so many pages you could do that with at a time before it got too cumbersome and, and the edges started 
being way off from each other because they're folding around each other. And very early they became a standard for how many pieces of paper, uh, vellum of skin you could tie together. Well, once you get one section of 20 pages, 24 pages, whatever it was, uh, tied together, then you could figure out a way to tie those three or four, five, six of them together. And now you have a whole book. And now you could do, you see, what even the Hebrews still can't do in the synagogue. Because there's no way you can put the Old Testament on one scroll. So in Jesus' day, the Old Testament books that were being read were individual scrolls. There are only so many, so much you can put on a scroll before it's too big to use. And uh, that's why we probably end up with first and second kings. No logic as to why, you know, there's some logic in the break at that particular time in the chronology, but why not have one book of kings? Well, you couldn't have one scroll of kings. You had to put it in two scrolls. Uh, you could put all 12 prophets on one scroll because they're all really short. So you didn't have to have a scroll of Joel, one for Amos, one for Jonah and Micah. You could put them all on one scroll. Uh, so a scroll would be like the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Like a, a very small yeah. Size. And, and, uh, and it would be limited in its duration. Right. You could have the, the book of Genesis can be on a scroll. You have to write small, but you can put it on there. Uh, but you can't have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You can't have the whole Torah on a scroll and it be legend. And, you know, I suppose a, a Solzhenitsyn who apparently could write in real little tiny letters, a mic could do it, uh, but you, you couldn't read it. Uh, and, and, and so, even in the New Testament, when uh, Jesus goes to the Nazareth temple, a uh, synagogue, and they hand him the book of Isaiah. Well, they're not giving him a book, they're giving him the scroll of Isaiah. Because that's a pretty complicated process. And very early there seems to be controls over who gets to do that. And obviously you're limited to the people who can do it, the scribes who can read and write. Uh, it's entirely likely, if not probable, that most synagogues didn't even have the whole Old Testament. They had probably the scrolls of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the, the Torah, and they probably had some of the prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah. But the, it's not likely that even, especially the small communities, uh, that they could afford to have the whole Old Testament. They had what scrolls they had, what scrolls they could afford. Uh, and uh, this, this again illustrates the fact that the scrolls were there much more for reading to others than they were reading for yourself. In fact, there's some indication that reading silently didn't even exist till after the time of Jesus. Now, not that anybody had never thought of it before, but maybe not. Uh, reading, the word reading, when you see it in the Old Testament, is the, the same word for the word to call out or to shout, because that's, that's how they read. They read out loud. And most people, they, a lot of people couldn't read. So anytime something was being read, except by the priest or one of the scribes, uh, you were reading to a whole collection of people. So you, you, you wanted it to be verbal. And this, of course, then involves you into the whole issue of, well, once he started to read in the story, once he started reading the sermon, once he started reading the long poem of Isaiah, 
How close attention did he pay to the text? And how free was he to read that in his words, his phrasing? Even when they read, did they have the expectation of precision that we think of when we read, even when we're reading aloud? It, uh, when, when I read the Bible aloud in a church service, I read for meaning of that section of reading. And that means I may not read exactly what's in the text in front of me. The text has and, and I may read so. Uh, when we started this church 50 plus years ago, uh, we had a strong contingent of people who insisted on the King James being used. So I used the King James, but I didn't read Old English. There were no V's and thou's, it was you. Uh, there is every indication that the ancients read that way too. Uh, you're, you're reading this psalm aloud to the crowd. You may not be a good enough singer to be singing it, so you're just reading it. But you know the psalm. How careful are you being? Do you have to be? Is it expected for you to be? To say this in exactly the same words, in exactly the same order that they appear in the written text that you're looking at. Which of course, you aren't looking at much because you don't need to. And of course, the, the people wouldn't know for sure. And there again, and, you know, if the next day he read the same psalm, there'd be some who would, well, wait a minute. Now, that's not the word he used yesterday. But would that bother them? Did, did in, in this verbal society, where you're, where, you're, where you're reading tradition and you're reading poetry and you're reading story, what was the expectation of its exact representation of a written text that was in front of you. And, and that's, that's a whole different issue that we need to recognize that may lie behind why Matthew tells the story this way and Mark tells the story slightly differently. Uh, there is the same story they each have a couple of pieces of information the other one doesn't have. Uh, they're, they may be telling the story in a different place in their book. And so that they want to be, they're using it to emphasize a slightly different thing about Jesus. Uh, and even if the people, even if everybody in the church had the Bible in their hands, were they, would they be expecting this reader to follow exactly as it was in the text in front of them. Okay, I think that about put us out of time. Uh, next week, we'll look at this whole issue of how do we understand? No, we're not, not gonna look at the whole issue. We're gonna, we're gonna take a little tiny glimpse into the issue how do we deal with the fact that the Bible writers and the people they're quote quoting <laughs> express frequently the guidance, the influence of God? All writings are inspired of God, Paul can say. But they're not anywhere near alike. 
uh, they're in human language with all of the oddities and idiosyncrasies and um, uh, ambiguities that human language has, every human language. Uh, how do these two go together? And uh, how do we wrestle with that? If this is word of God, exactly how is it word of God? How should I understand it as word of God? And you see, how you deal with that ultimately impinges upon then how you understand it and what you do with it. Now, you may not be conscious of that connection, but it's there. So uh, go look at uh, some passages. To talk about the word of the Lord came to me. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Okay. I'll send you a couple of uh, uh, handouts to bug you, uh, perk your thinking up. Okay, see you next week. Did I gain any new ones? Guess not. Everybody there? Anybody questions online? Not really. Okay. We'll see you all next week. Same time, Thank same you. station. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too. It's Have a good night. Thank you. Yes, you are welcome. Um, well, we can turn the heat up. Well, we can turn the heat up. That's no problem. So, I have a quick question. So yes. Is the dates that are listed there, you know, the 3,000 we yeah. see, the 35 above, I mean, it, is one of those supposed to be the, the time when the Bible came together? Oh, no. This is, these are writings in these countries. Okay. The Bible begins to emerge um, very, you can, there are, there are some who put Moses at the 1500 level. Okay. Um, that's not the major scholarly position nowadays, okay. but uh, some of the uh, traditional views put Moses at 1500 okay. and believe uh, obviously that Moses actually wrote much. Uh, yes, there's one here you can take. I was also going to say, I mean, I know most of your classes online, but um, you, you could zoom in a little bit for like actual numbers. Like, I don't know if you have an issue, but I don't have glasses, but like. Sure, I can make it bigger. Just, just holler if you can't, just holler if you can't see, if you can't see it. Uh, well, I mean, you could just like the plus sign at the bottom right of the, of the Word document, all the way at the bottom of the plus sign. Move your mouse all the way to the right. There's a little, keep going, and keep going. So if you wanted to make it smaller, there's that little line assigned. If you want to make it bigger, there's a plus sign. Keep going, keep going. Okay. Yeah, you can do that as well. Yeah, I can enlarge it. Whatever you need. So we can get hard copy. Yes. Yeah, do we need a hard copy? We have to do that, right? Do hard copy? No, it's there's copy right here. Oh, yeah, okay. there's one right here. Well, actually, I'm going to have to do that.
Bible, say the difference between the Catholic Bible and... We'll do that in the canon. Okay. And there's a section of the... Yes, books. the, the uh, we'll look at the issue of which books stand up in the Bible. But I was wondering how they, does that also tell us, like, how did they come about? So some yes. Of books, yeah. don't even, some of us, you know, other... Yeah, we'll talk other about things. those, which, the specific books and what we know about their history. Yeah, because they don't know about angels, but we don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have two things for you. The first one is, so it's when Jesus grabbed the scroll, I said, uh, to read it. So we know that he spoke Hebrew. One would assume, and there's no reason to assume not, that, that he could not read Hebrew. Uh, the The... The, the, Jewish, the Jewish schools of Jesus' day uh, were pretty common in the synagogues. And uh, a, a devout family uh, would undoubtedly have taught, um, ha had taught their sons at least to be able to read Hebrew, uh, uh, at least at the cursory level, much as they many do still even reform Jews will require a, a boy at his bar mitzvah to be able to read the passage in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, you know, he, he, may knew, he may know very little more than enough to know the sounds and the symbols and there again, he may have already practiced this numerous times verbally. So he almost has it memorized verbally. Uh, so he can stand in front of it and hold the scroll and read the passage. But at least he knows all the sounds and he knows how to make them and he recognizes the letters. Uh, and uh, uh, this undoubtedly was uh, true in Jesus' day. Uh, so for him to pick up the scroll and read it, uh, there's an interesting passage we'll look at way over in the Old Testament where uh, they describe a lad out in the field. And they, they grab him about something and he reads. Uh, so wh while it is, it is, uh, you, you can't say this was a literate society, that reading and writing was common. It certainly was not exclusive to just the professional scribes. Uh, well, you never know. You, 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 you never, yeah, I know. And, and in, in uh, traditional Judaism, that becomes a very fixed thing. But even in rigid Orthodox Judaism, there are stories about rabbis who taught their daughters or a daughter, uh, even when there was a son. Uh, and uh, daughters who insisted on learning, who figured out how to do it. Uh, who, uh, so we have women grown women, mothers, uh, women of substance in the community who uh, are known not just as literate, but as, uh, quote, a Bible scholar. She knows the Bible. Uh, the, uh, we're, you're going to run into the story in the Old Testament. Uh, in the days of Jeremiah and Josiah, there's a, uh, a, a renovation of the temple and they discover the book of Moses. And who do they call on to validate it? A woman, a prophetess. Not Deborah. No, it's not Deborah. No. Uh, 
but you know, as 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 monumental of an issue as this is, it's a lady. So I, uh, that's my point: is the fact that we have this very rigid stereotype out of Orthodox Judaism. Uh, don't don't uh, don't project that back on Old Testament times necessarily. Uh, we uh, that it's another one of those cases you see where I constantly insist let's recognize our abysmal ignorance. There is just so so much we don't know, uh, and for us to project back on that. Uh, when we talk about the emergence of the Old Testament, the idea that the Old Testament, the books of Moses particularly, emerged from the, the merging of four or five documents together. Well, that's the kind of thing that maybe an 18th century American or German scholar would think of. That's, that's how we would imagine how you would get these, these various features in the story you you would ex, you would think of it you would envision this as an editorial process that combines some stories but that's a that's a fully cultural acculturated uh, model that you're working with how do you know what the model was in, in 750 bc You, you have the, 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 the arguments over the reading of Genesis. Is there how literal is Genesis? I don't have any idea how a thousand years before Jesus, Semitic people understood that story. How quote, historical, scientific, uh, actual. I have no idea how they envisioned this story. Because uh, we don't 